Good morning and welcome to the homecoming and the Goldman School Center on Civility and Democratic Engagement panel. The panel is an election like no other, ensuring democracy's survival. My name is Dan Lindheim. I'm a professor at Goldman and the faculty director of the center. The center was created by the class of 1968 for their 40th reunion. Some classes give benches. Class of 68 gave a center. The center promotes democratic engagement and civil discourse through faculty and student research, teaching, providing student fellowships and internships, and putting on public events like this one today. More information on the center is available on the website and it can be found by Googling Center on Civility and Democratic Engagement or by going to the Goldman School of Public Policy website and selecting centers. Election experts, both Republican and Democrat, know that turnout determines elections, especially close elections. Maximizing the turnout of your own supporters is campaigning 101. There's also a more nefarious side where deliberate efforts are made, whether by governments or organizations or private parties, or now even in international agencies or entities to create impediments to voting. These are sometimes designed with the express purpose of depressing the other side's turnout. Today's panel focuses on efforts to promote democratic engagement by encouraging voting, by ensuring voter turnout, and avoiding efforts to suppress turnout, whatever the reasons, <clears throat> political, pandemic, or in this election, some combination of the two. We've already seen insanely long lines for early voting. We've seen efforts to possibly delay the US mail. The good news, there is early and mail-in voting, especially during the pandemic. The bad news, long voting lines, fears of slowed mail are often too often a strategy, not a necessity. Today's panel will speak to the most critical issues of this election, the very issues that the two candidates were asked about in the first debate. COVID-19, voting and ballot counting under the reality of COVID-19, efforts to both promote and suppress voting, charges of election irregularities, and President Trump's effort to separate Biden from his progressive base in an effort to reduce the Biden vote. Our panel includes some of the leading, nation's leading experts on COVID-19. We have the most knowledgeable official regarding voting and vote processing in California. We have the campus's leading legal expert on voting and election law. And we have a national expert about probably the most determinative issue of this election, whether the Democratic base will turn out in substantial numbers. The presentations will be followed by a brief panel discussion and then questions from the audience. To ask questions, there's a link on the sign-in page. I want to now introduce today's panel. Our first speaker is Patrol Ross. Professor, professor Ross is Chancellor's Professor of Law at Berkeley Law. He has a wide range of expertise and teaches courses on legislation, election law, and constitutional law. He's widely published and his most recent work is Fair Elections During a Crisis, Urgent Recommendations in Law, Media, Politics, and Tech to advance the legitimacy of and the public's confidence in the November 2020 election. Next will be Amy Allison, the founder and president of She the People, a national network elevating the voice and power of women of color. Allison leads national efforts to build inclusive multiracial coalitions led by women of color to increase voter engagement and advocate for racial, economic, and gender justice. She is the author of Army of None. John Schwartzberg is Clinical Professor Emeritus of the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. He chairs the editorial board of the school's health and wellness publications. If you subscribe to the wellness letter, he is the chair of the board. He is past director of UC Berkeley and UCSF joint uh, medical program. He is board certified in internal medicine and infectious disease. He spent 30 years in clinical practice and he is on all forms of media almost on a daily basis talking about COVID. Uh, we'll go first to Bertrand Ross. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the introduction. It's great to be here. I wish we could all be together in Berkeley right now as we uh, were last year. Um, but I hope you are well wherever you may be. So I, I consider this to be the most consequential election for African-Americans and communities of color since 1860. 
That election, of course, came in the face of the existential threat to this republic, slavery, that destroyed the lives of African Americans. This, ele this election comes in the face of existential threats to this country and to the planet. The existential threats to our country are a pandemic and the potential for social disorder arising from it that has coincided with governmental promotion of race-based hate designed to distract from that very pandemic that feeds further into that potential for a disorder. And in the background is an existential threat to the planet that is climate change, that the United States as a leading contributor is doing little to counteract and that will continue to disproportionately impact people of color around the world. And what we have seen in the various primaries since the pandemic and what I expect to see much more in the general elections is the same old voter suppression practices to target low propensity minority voters in particular. But this time, those who promote voter suppression will have the pandemic as both a justification for those practices and a tool to suppress, to support those practices. And we've all seen President Trump's efforts to de delegitimize mail-in voting during a pandemic. In the minds of the Trump campaign, limiting mail-in voting will force people to go to the polls and vote in person. Whereas it is difficult to prevent or disincentivize people from physically mailing in a ballot, there are tried and true methods to prevent or disincentivize people from voting in person for which the pandemic would provide justificatory cover. One tried and true method is limiting the number of polling places, particularly in minority neighborhoods. Such limits, of course, lead to long lines and long waits that we are already seeing in the early voting. In the past, limits on the number of polling places in minority communities were said to be justified by the number of voters in minority precincts in prior elections. But that, just, that justification did not hold much weight with observers. But this time, state election officials who might have pursued the same actions in the past can now point to the decline in the number of poll workers as a reason for the reduction of polling places. The typical poll worker is an elderly person volunteering to do a service for his or her community. But in this pandemic, of course, the elderly are the most vulnerable to the fatal consequences from the virus. And so many have decided during the pandemic, during the primaries at least, to not put their lives at risk. Fewer poll workers, fewer polls, and if things go according to how they have gone in the past elections, that will mean fewer, even fewer poll, polls in minority neighborhoods and communities. And the Trump campaign appears to be banking on the hope that low propensity voters of color will now want to wait in long lines to vote which will be made to look even longer by social distancing requirements at polling places in the middle of a pandemic. And polls showing that Biden is likely to win might paradoxically bolster the strategy as it might reduce the incentives for supporters of Biden to wait in a long line to vote during the pandemic because they might decide that their vote will not be necessary for a Biden win. For those brave souls who persevere in the long lines, they will have waiting for them near the polling places people hired by the Trump campaign and others to engage in so-called election protection. Ostensibly, they are there to protect the integrity of the election, but I expect that most, if not all, will be placed at polls in predominantly minority communities. And while, I, and while I am cautiously optimistic that these election observers will not participate in violent acts against people trying to vote like their counterparts from the past, they will be there to discourage voting through more passive intimidation and challenges to the voters' qualifications at the polls. Now, it's important to recognize that in many states, an elector or poll watcher can challenge a voter's qualification at the polls. And even though there will not be a legitimate basis for almost all of the challenges, and even though the voter will eventually be able to vote, the effects of these challenges is to delay voting so that those long lines will be slow moving and contribute to voter attrition. None of these voter suppressive efforts are possible with mail-in voting, which is one reason why the Trump administration is trying to delegitimize mail-in voting, bringing legal challenges against mail-in voting practices and has threatened the funding of the post office. Now, Republicans are not all in agreement with the strategy as some see mail-in voting as advantageous to their electoral prospects, but as has been the norm over the past four years, at least, divergent Republican party preferences tend to be subordinated to those of President Trump. A second age old voter suppressive strategy that will be bolstered during the pandemic is a campaign of misinformation targeting communities of color. This strategy was used effectively during the 2016 campaign and may have contributed to the lower than expected turnout numbers of African-Americans in places like Milwaukee and Detroit. One form of disinformation will be to supply voters of color with damaging and often false information about Biden to reduce the desire to vote for him. But in addition to this strategy, what will likely move to the forefront is a misinformation campaign about the logistics of voting. In fact, we're already seeing that happen um, through social media and other outlets. Misinformation about how and where you can vote will be even more effective in a pandemic when people see in the news and by word of mouth that ways of voting are being adjusted in states throughout the country. Since information about how and where to vote is surprisingly hard to come by, misinformation campaigns can be quite effective, 
as it will lead people to try to vote in the wrong way or at the wrong polling place that could come at the cost of their ballot counting or, or them voting at all. Finally, in the case of a Trump loss, there, will, there might be a, an election delegitimation campaign similar to the one operationalized by Trump in 2016. If Trump is willing to delegitimize an election he actually won, you can, actually, you can only imagine what he will do to an election he loses. There will probably be claims of illegal voting by non-citizens that subject the status and belonging to Latinx, of Latinx voters to question. There will probably be the targeting of mostly female and minority election officials in states and localities alleging that they engage in the corrupt processing and counting of ballots, leading to questions about their competence and integrity. And all of these efforts will likely be focused on rallying the base to engage in more civilly disobedient forms of protest, targeting minority communities to test the public's tolerance for disorder in hopes of using backdoor mechanisms to secure the election if necessary. Now coming out of my mouth, this all would have sounded rather outlandish in the days before the pandemic or even the early months of the pandemic. But with the president's consistent questioning of the validity of forms of voting and his recent remarks refusing to commit to the peaceful transition of power unless he decides the election is free and fair, significant doubts have been raised about whether we will be able to avoid disorder after this election. And this threat to post-election disorder can have turnout effects as those low propensity voters who might be conflict averse and not intensely invested in a particular election outcome decide it is not worth the potential for disorder to vote for Biden or to vote at all. At the end of the day, voting is a fundamental right that in an ideal world would be exercised by everyone. In the unusual circumstances of a pandemic, voting is more uncertain, more risky, and more costly in terms of information needed to know how to vote. And these unusual circumstances are likely to have a greater impact on low propensity voters. These are some of the challenges we face going forward in these last two and a half weeks leading to the election. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I thank you all for listening. I'll pass it over to the next panelist. Thank you, Bertral. Uh, Amy. Uh, thank you. That was, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, it's an honor to be part of uh, this celebration. And Dan, thanks for uh, asking me to be part of the center's uh, celebration today. Uh, I'm Amy Allison, founder of She the People, a national network elevating the voice and political power of women of color. I started the organization after the 2016 elections, told us a couple of things about the wide, widely held um, but fictional understanding of who is actually in the American electorate. You see, women of color, uh, Black women, uh, Latinas, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Indigenous women, were never really discussed when it talked about uh, the calculus for uh, winning. It wasn't talked about in, in terms of investing in or turning out the communities. But the fact is that uh, women of color are the fastest growing voting bloc in the country. And 17 days out from the election, we our eyes are fixed on a certain handful of states that are gonna make all the difference for the presidential contest. Those states are mostly majority people of color where women of color are more than a quarter of the electorate. We gotta keep our eye on Arizona, on Texas, Georgia, Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And in there is also North Carolina. Um, those are the states where when we look at the numbers from 2016 till now, uh, uh, women of color are really gonna be the margin of victory uh, it, for the Democrats. And let, let, let me tell you why. Um, even though we had been in, ignored as a, we are definitely have been a, a political force and a driver in election after election, black women are the highest turnout uh, voters of any race and gender. And the numbers of uh, the fastest growing Asian American and also the, the huge numbers of vote eligible Latinas, as well as the critical uh, role that indigenous women are playing in traditional red states like Idaho are, has been um, uh, undercounted and undervalued until now. But if we look at some of the key states that I just mentioned, look at Arizona. The, the gap that Trump won Arizona was 91,000 in 2016, yet women of color who did not vote, who were eligible to vote on the voter rolls was 341,000. If we look at Georgia, uh, Trump won that state by 211,000, and yet the women of color who did not vote in 2016 was 521,000. So we have a lot of, we have the same kind of uh, set of data that helps us to understand both who's living in these states, these states in the South and Southwest, 
uh, many uh, former Confederacy states or former states that were Mexico at one point in our history have a, uh, have a population, the majority of people of color. And women of color uh, have uh, been discounted, dehumanized, and sidelined by both parties. As a result, an underinvestment in speaking to, and more importantly, having, uh, having messages, having policies and politics and leaders that really activate and speak to women of color has been uh, the, the, the biggest, uh, I think, positive message in uh, the, this last year. Uh, she the People spent a lot of time listening to women of color, particularly in the battleground states, uh, hearing what it was going to take, understanding what the politics need to look like. We understood uh, even as far back as the, the primary, the caucus in Nevada, Nevada being the first people of color majority state in which women of color were 26% of the electorate. Uh, we understood that back then, uh, the rise of white nationalist violence was a big top concern. Healthcare was another big concern um, and ongoing economic health where uh, even before the pandemic had uh, had a stranglehold on our economy and people's well-being, um, the fact is that uh, women of color understood COVID-19 to be an extension and exasperation of the already crisis level uh, that women of color were experiencing on all levels in terms of ac access to healthcare, in terms of safety and security, in, in, in terms of uh, economic stability and ability to build wealth. And so uh, we knew then what was important. We also heard loud and clear way back at the beginning of the year that we needed a woman of color on the ticket to activate the numbers of women of color for high turnout. And so we uh, spent many, many months making the argument on the national stage that when it came down to um, you know, older white men who are not representative of the base, and just to understand, I don't use the term minority in any of my uh, conversations about women of color because here in our home state of California, we're the majority of women. And in the states I'm talking about, in the battleground states account, we're the majority of women. And so we need to rethink uh, and recast the way that we're using language to describe this powerhouse block of voters. When Kamala Harris was announced to be on the ticket, understanding the critical nature of women of color, both black women and Asian American women and just women of color in general, it was a huge, huge win. Her role uh, has been as a Senator. Okay. You know, she comes from our most populous state and she has cut her teeth on building multiracial coalitions and speaking to us. And, um, uh, nationally she's played a critical role, uh, advocating for economic justice, cash payments, uh, for people who, uh, government, uh, support has run out for people, uh, unemployment in a state like, uh, Florida, a third of the people who applied for unemployment have not received a single check. Um, um, so she's been advocating for that. She has been out front talking about racial justice. Um, she has been uh, a leading voice and continues to be on the ticket speaking uh, to the multiracial groups of people, many of whom were out in the streets and in um, July and uh, June this year calling for America to deal with its racism. And you can see the pushback in uh, the way that uh, just like women of color who uh, run for office or, or who are living our lives, we see people like uh, Senator Perdue who, out of Georgia who's, who's facing an, uh, a tough battle with John Ossoff in, in Georgia, getting on stage, uh, talking about her name and trying to mispronounce it and dismissing her. Uh, the use of the particular combination of racism and sexism is not new, but it's, uh, we recognize it. And we're in a position now with our increased political power to push back against that and say, uh, we want, uh, this is not about policy. This is, a, this is about the humanity of people and so many people who live here. We think of it as a new American majority. So our work uh, has been in helping solidify women of color, not as a racial identity, but as a political term of solidarity that forms a core of a uh, inclusive multiracial coalition that can include everyone. But the fact of the matter is for Democrats, high turnout uh, 
high turnout of women of color by uh, two to four percent in these specific states would flip the states and win the electoral college votes uh, needed for the Biden-Harris ticket to win the White House. And um, I say all that to say it's been critically important that we have a woman of color uh, at the top of the ticket who can articulate uh, those uh, those concerns. Now, I did the numbers and, and uh, it was widely reported yesterday. Uh, in 2016, around this time, uh, about 18 days out, 1.4 million people had cast an early vote. And yesterday, 21 million people had cast an early vote. This is good, not only, it's not just good news for the Democrats who have the, have the people who live in these states who are, uh, uh, who are likely, who are basically, this is a referendum um, uh, about Trump and about this kind of politics, but it's also bigger than that. It's, it's about our democracy. And you'll see women of color um, in a Texas organizing project who's been registering and speaking to and organizing communities of color for a decade, um, who have led to uh, historic turnouts in Harris County, which is in the Houston area. Uh, first day of early voting, over 100,000 people cast, and you saw those big lines, which uh, 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 Dan was talking about uh, earlier. Um, you see women, uh, women of color who are leading the new Florida majority, who are right now training uh, uh, legal, sc legal scholars and defenders of voting rights so that it's not just the right wing, scary uh, people with guns who are intimidating voters at the polls in these long lines that we anticipate, but people who are pro-democracy advocates who are really an extension of those who have been fighting to expand the franchise of democracy to make sure that everyone who's eligible can vote. I just want to say just in you know concluding uh, my re remarks is that we do it was laid out all the challenges that we have and women of color really at the the center uh, of the most targeted for voter suppression both by not engaging and investing in us but also uh, the attacks and creating a culture of hostility and the practical matters where uh, we're getting, um, still, we have to make sure that we're on the voter rolls. We have to uh, stand in inordinately long lines or uh, try to vote early with the questionable post office. Uh, even in California, we have uh, the Republicans putting up fake ballot boxes, collecting ballots, which our Secretary of State uh, and we're having an expert from the office will talk about. But all of these things uh, are, uh, really net net trying to, trying to depress the vote. But I, I take Stacey Abrams and Fair Fight's lead in all of this. Um, I worked with Stacey Abrams' gubernatorial campaign in Georgia. I can tell you the heartbreaking and ugly um, lying and cheating around, um, uh, around preventing people from exercising the right to vote. But I've also seen something else. I've seen incredible certitude, um, people holding up democracy and being, uh, being willing to crawl through glass to cast their vote. I've seen the lines and we will continue to see high vote turnout amongst women of color who are gonna make the difference um, this year. I gathered a group of women of color uh, from 38 states. Uh, uh, there were 600 of us and we started texting, texting uh, women of color um, in Pennsylvania and Texas, and now Arizona. It's, it was the largest national specifically targeted uh, turnout effort by women of color for women of color. And so far, we're almost uh, texting 400,000 um, across those states, and we're going to continue. I think that's, that's it. Even though we have challenges, we have an a cr incredible opportunity uh, to really change the calculus and a new center of gravity about what our democracy and our water politics can produce. And so I thank you very much for being part of this conversation. Thank you, Amy. John. Thanks, Dan. And thanks to the other panelists. And thanks to everybody who's watching. I'd like to talk a little bit about the significance of COVID and the implications for this election going forward. Um, let me begin by just giving us an idea of where we are in the United States and the world. Right now, the world has around 40 million cases that have been reported. That's way less than the absolute number, but we'll use that number. And there have been about 1 million deaths so far from COVID. 
In the United States, we have about 8 million cases with about 200, about 220 million, uh, sorry, 220,000 deaths. The important numbers tucked into that are that the United States has about 4% of the world's population. Yet the United States has 20% of the cases of COVID on this planet. And we have 22% of the deaths on this planet. So I'd like to address with you for just a very few minutes where we've gone wrong, because that will inform us as to how we want to go forward. Where we've gone wrong in one place has been that we may have the wrong culture for a pandemic. And by that, I mean, we don't have the most empathetic of cultures in the United States. And empathy is what makes people recognize that we have a terrible problem in the United States, even when we can't see it amongst the people around us. More specifically, it's estimated that on average, each American knows 600 people. For every American to know somebody who's died of COVID, if COVID was equally distributed throughout our society, we'd have to have about 500,000 deaths and we have about 220,000 deaths. So a lot of Americans don't know someone who's died. Without knowing, somebody who's, without knowing someone who's died of this pandemic in the United States, people who don't have a great deal of empathy are not gonna react very much to it. The invisible people with COVID in the United States are the majority of people who have this infection. Um, by that, I mean, if you, roughly about five times more Latinx or African-Americans are hospitalized for every white or Asian that's hospitalized with COVID in the United States. That the deaths in the Latinx population and in the African-American population greatly exceed the number of deaths seen in the Asian population and in the white population in the United States. People who are underserved in the United States in terms of homeless or challenge for shelter, challenge for food, have roughly five times the death rate of people who have shelter, have food. People who are insecure in their environment because of stress are about two times at risk of dying. So if you come from a more privileged part of our culture, you're less likely to see someone who's died and you're less likely to therefore react to the severity of this culture, excuse me, of this uh, pandemic. Some of the other problems that we faced with this pandemic in terms of going, that can inform us about going forward are that there's been decades of public health under, underfunding. We've known about pandemics coming to the United States for at least the 1960s. Just look at the 21st century. In 2002, we had SARS. In 2009, we had the influenza H1N1 pandemic. In 2012, there was the uh, MERS pandemic. And now in 2019, we had the, and we're having SARS-CoV-2. That's four pandemics in 20 years in the United States that have included the United States. We're gonna be seeing many more. There's gonna be SARS-CoV-20, SARS-CoV-23, SARS-CoV-28. We need to be better prepared. And yet this pandemic occurred when we've been had decades of underfunding of public health. We also know that action came much too late here in the United States, that even though um, we well knew the severity of COVID by the third week of January and the toll that it was gonna take on this country and the world, there was complete inaction um, by leadership. It's been estimated that just between January and May, had we acted more promptly, about 50% of the people who died in those four months would not have died. Another problem that COVID is under, uh, has really laid bare is our tremendously fragmented healthcare industry. With a fragmented industry, we can't perform, we can't react to a pandemic in a unified way. And that's why we see different states popping up with 
higher rates of infection than other states. We, we see some states where governors forbid masking and we see the consequences of that. And those states have paid the consequences for that. It's made no sense how we've managed things on a statewide basis, much less even in a local basis where hospital systems compete with each other. Another area that um, COVID has really demonstrated that we've, I think most Americans have been well aware of is that the messaging has been disastrous. When we have a president of the United States who um, lies on a daily basis multiple times and who has given not only um, dishonest messages about the pandemic, but has led people in the wrong direction, for example, with masking, for example, with uh, congregating people together, which we know is so risky. How, do, how can you possibly expect a society to respond rationally to a pandemic? We know that there's been tremendous inadequate testing here in the United States. We started with a fiasco with the CDC and we've never really caught up from that. We still are doing less testing than we need to hold this pandemic where it is, much less mitigate most of the risk. Attached to that, of course, is the inadequate stockpiling of PPE. Our healthcare workers still don't have enough PPE. We still tell our population, don't wear, a, don't wear an N95 mask because we need to reserve them for our healthcare workers, and they still don't have enough. So fundamental problems with that. And finally, the politicization of our key agencies. I've been a physician now for 50 years. I've been an infectious disease specialist for 45 of those years. And I've always highly respected the Centers for Disease Control. And yet the messaging coming out of the Centers for Disease Control during this pandemic have been very disappointing. And it's not because of the people who work there. I know a lot of them, they're outstanding. They're so dedicated and so well-educated and they can solve a lot of our problems. But it's the people who are messaging out of the CDC that are controlled by the White House that have led to very a very disappointing response. So no trust in the CDC. And the same can be said for the FDA because of its politicization outstanding, dedicated career people in the FDA, in the FDA, and yet their voices aren't heard because it's been so politicized. So think about what happens when we get a vaccine. Who's gonna trust Donald Trump? Who's gonna trust even the CDC or the FDA when they're so politicized? This presents a tremendous problem for confronting the pandemic because in spite of what we've heard recently with the, the great uh, Barrington uh, Declaration, which is, uh, as uh, Tony Fauci describes as nonsense, which it absolutely is, we do need to get to herd immunity, but we need to get there with a safe and effective vaccine. Yet, even if we have a safe and effective vaccine, our society has been so lied to for so long that it's hard to imagine a lot of people trusting. And this presents a tremendous problem. So we're really confronted with myriad problems that are all self-inflicted by um, a regime in this country that has um, perpetrated that upon us. And it has really been the perfect storm of a pandemic coming at a time when we've been underfunded in public health and when we have an administration um, that is not all at all interested in the health of our public. Thank you, John. Um, when I was introducing people, um, my screen went blank and I did not introduce James Schwab. Uh, James is the Chief Deputy Secretary of State for Policy and Planning for the State of California, where he oversees implementation of recent election reforms. James previously served as Chief of Legislative Affairs for the agency. He's also worked as a legislative staffer and has managed several local election campaigns. Uh, James works directly with the Secretary of State, uh, by the uh, James, go ahead. Thank you for having me here today, uh, especially during this important time. We are 18 days away from the election and it's no better time to catch up and learn what's going on uh, than today. 
So I'm going to start off with a little bit about how we got here. Uh, in a certain sense, California has been preparing for this for a long time. Uh, for over 40 years, California has offered uh, no excuse vote by mail. Uh, and for about 20 years, we've offered permanent uh, vote by mail status. So for the past several decades, the popularity of vote by mail has grown to the point where in our March primary, 75% of voters got a ballot in the mail. So California has been well poised to adapt to the changes, uh, which I'll speak about in a moment, uh, that have come with COVID. And this is in contrast to what you see in other states. And that's sort of where oftentimes there's a blurring of the lines between what's happening in California and what you see in other states in terms of vote by mail. Many states had little to no vote by mail. Uh, all states offered some amount of it, but there's many hurdles or just wasn't a lot uh, of usage in past elections. But now those states are ramping up. And more often than not, what you'll see is just the errors that come with ramping up vote by mail in other states. And California's worked through those over the years. And so, uh, and like I said, in many senses, we're, we've just been better prepared um, given our history of vote by mail. So uh, we also dodged a, a bullet too, because um, we moved our primary this year. Uh, traditionally, it's in early June, and we moved at the beginning of March to make our votes more relevant during the primary process. And the day after our March primary was the first state, state of emergency order for COVID. Uh, so we dodged, um, dodged it there. And if you recall early June, if we hadn't moved our primary from June, early June, we had curfews, we had National Guard deployed. Uh, it would have been a, an extreme challenge to have held our primary in June. So we got lucky this year as well. And we were able to learn from other states that held their primaries after us about how and, and what we should do to adopt for November. So after the first emergency order in March, we began to hear from election officials that they were losing poll workers, that poll workers that had committed to November were backing out and voting locations, polling places that had committed to November were also backing out. So we knew we had a problem on our hand and that we knew we had to change and, and adopt. So we convened civil rights organizations, community groups, election officials, policymakers, and we met for about a month uh, through uh, March and into April and came up with a set of recommendations that ended up being uh, both an executive order from the governor, as well as uh, two pieces of legislation that were signed into law. So I'll go into a little bit about those changes that were built upon um, collaboration with uh, a whole host of of groups. So there's going to be two ways uh, folks can vote, and we wanted to make sure that was possible. Um, we didn't want to make, we didn't want voters to have to choose between their health and their right to vote. But we also understand that while vote by mail is popular in California, in-person voting is just as important for many, many reasons. One, some people are just more comfortable voting uh, in person, or they might need language assistance, or they might need physical assistance because they have a disability. Maybe they lost their ballot and they wanna get a new ballot or they need to register to vote. So we knew the importance of in-person voting and maintaining that. So our approach was to offer county election officials a choice that you maintain what you were able to have in March and in previous primaries in terms of in-person voting locations uh, and drop boxes, or we'll provide you with an alternative model. Most of the counties in California are choosing the alternative model. I think the one exception in the Bay Area is Contra Costa County. I think they're going with what they had in previous elections, but all the other counties, Alameda, uh, Santa Clara, San Mateo, I think San Francisco are taking on this alternative model. And what does that look like? So we maintain a certain level of in-person uh, voting. We require one voting location for every 10,000 registered voters. And then we also require uh, one uh, official drop box for every 15,000 registered voters. And um, that makes sure that there's both the in-person options and uh, the drop boxes. Those drop boxes must be open for 28 days and the in-person options must be open for a minimum of four days, uh, election day and the three days prior. So uh, to make sure that the reduction in locations 
didn't lead to any disenfranchisement. We expanded in-person early voting and expanded uh, the availability of drop boxes to ensure that those options were available. Now, the other important factor of in-person voting was health and safety. So we worked with uh, the California Department of Public Health um, and from feedback we were getting from our colleagues in other states, we established in-person public health guidelines for polling places, as well as county elections offices. And with those, uh, we were able to procure and purchase um, PPE, cleaning supplies, um, new trainings for poll workers, and ensure that that in-person voting experience is gonna be a healthy and safe one. And that's what I, want, I definitely want to emphasize is in-person voting, uh, they'll be socially, socially distanced. Uh, um, poll workers will be wearing masks, they'll be disinfectant, there'll be uh, hand sanitizer, masks will be offered to folks who don't wear masks. Um, so we wanted to make sure in-person was a uh, healthy and safe option as well. And as you might've heard, there's new types of polling locations because we've lost um, the old type, right? Garages, um, senior centers, uh, that were oftentimes polling places in the past are no longer available. And what's been really encouraging, and I have to, you know, I'm a, from Sacramento, I'm a Kings fan, but I gotta give respect to uh, LeBron James uh, for taking the lead on uh, really changing the attitude of the entire sports um, uh, environment. Uh, every major uh, sports team in California is helping out in some way. Most are going to be in-person voting locations. They're also helping with poll, uh, poll worker recruitment uh, and just promoting the election as well. So that, that's uh, a big change. I believe um, in the Bay Area, you have uh, the A's, the 49ers, the Giants, the Warriors uh, using their facilities to promote voting and, and in-person options. So that's been um, one of the positives out of this whole thing is to really more people coming to the table to, to support elections. We also had the concern about poll workers. Uh, and that's actually was, uh, as we moved through the year, became less and less of an issue. Uh, there's been some national efforts um, by groups like uh, Power to the Polls. And we ourselves put together a, a new centralized spot for um, voters to sign up to be poll workers. And we were able to sign up 120,000 volunteers through those efforts. Uh, California regularly probably uses around 30,000 poll workers. So we have more than enough uh, to satisfy and meet the loss of, of the old generation of poll workers. Uh, a little bit about vote by mail, which is the other big change for California. Every registered voter in California uh, started receiving their vote by mail ballot in the beginning of October. And again, we went from 75% in March to 100% uh, in uh, November. And so not that much of a leap, but there was still a lot to get done, uh, especially the concerns around the U.S. Post Office. Now, again, California has a long history of working in the U.S. Post Office, and it's important to remember that what we hear coming out of D.C. is different than what we hear have here in California. We have established working relationships. We meet weekly at this point in time with our USPS partners that have been here and working in the USPS long before the current administration, and we'll be working there long after. They are dedicated public servants and are committed to making sure election mail goes in and out. And that's what we've seen so far. We closely tracked the delivery of vote by mail ballots to USPS plants. And there was, they were out to voters within a day or two of arriving at the USPS plant. So we've um, been happy to see that. We've also seen quick turnaround times of the return of vote by mail ballots. Uh, so far, I think as of this morning, we're over 3 million ballots cast. Uh, in California, which is um, compared to what we saw in 2016, where we had 500,000 ballots cast at this point in time. It's an enormous uh, jump in early voting, but also a testament that uh, the system's working. Ballots are being returned on time and election officials are counting them. Now it's important to remember, we also um, did do things to potentially uh, protect ourselves from impact to the USPS. First, uh, we changed what we call the postmark law. So in prior elections, if a ballot arrived within three days of the election, but was postmarked by election day, uh, it was able to be processed and counted. And that was to protect uh, voters who might be military overseas voters, or oftentimes uh, in disparate parts of the state, 
mail goes to another state and comes back, might go to Oregon and come back or, ne or Nevada and come back. And there could be a delay. So we've always had that law in place and it's, it's helped count uh, tens of thousands of ballots. This year, we expanded it from three days after the election to 17 days after the election. So plenty of time to get that ballot back to the elections official. It's postmarked by election day. So I like to you know, remind voters, it is safe to, to use the mail. It is safe to use a Dropbox as well. Uh, we do have postage prepaid on all of our uh, vote by mail envelopes. So it's no stamp needed. Um, and it's just as, just as cheap to use the mail as it is to use a Dropbox. My only advice is just not to try to mail your ballot back on election day because you might put it in a mailbox that's already been picked up that day. So that's my only uh, little uh, tip for returning your ballot um, between mail and, and Dropbox. Um, the other challenge we've had besides adapting to COVID and, and getting these changes in place is misinformation. Uh, we have not seen this level of misinformation. Uh, I don't think in, in any election official's lifetime, we've seen this level. Even in 2016, the misinformation out there was, uh, was more, was targeted and it was more about, um, you know, suppressing the vote uh, of certain demographics. They've expanded it now. It's just suppressing the vote widely um, in terms of, you know, undermining people's faith in, in vote by mail, undermining people's faith even in voting in person by uh, closing polling places and creating these long lines as, as uh, earlier speaker noted. Uh, and so that's been a tough job for us is trying to make sure that voters feel confident in all their options uh, to vote. So I wanna make it clear that voting by mail is safe and secure. In California and in many other states, uh, our vote by mail ballots are printed on watermarked paper. That's uniquely watermarked for each election. Uh, we place those ballots in envelopes that have barcodes unique to that voter. When that ballot gets back to the election official, they verify the signature on the ballot and they check to see if that voter had tried to cast a ballot anywhere else before that ballot is counted. So there is a whole process in place to make sure uh, that vote by mail is safe and secure. So don't believe the misinformation you might hear out there. And the other piece of misinformation that uh, you came up this past week is the, um, the story about fake drop boxes. Um, so last weekend, we became aware of drop boxes uh, placed in, in some public spaces with the label official drop box. Uh, and as we investigated, um, it turns out that they were being operated by uh, the Republican Party. So uh, the Secretary of State and Attorney General sent a cease and desist letter to the state part of the California Republican Party uh, to take the boxes down. And a little bit of background before I go down that path a little more. So California um, has been criticized um, from Republicans for a number of elections over what we, uh, how we allow voters to return their ballots. The Republicans like to call it ballot harvesting. And that's, again, a nefarious term for a law that's meant to enfranchise voters. So in California, we allow voters to designate someone they trust to return their ballot for them. That person who returns it for them has to sign the ballot envelope and return it within three days. If that returner doesn't do that, they don't return it, they don't sign it, that's a felony. You can get in trouble for that. But we allow the voters to have that option because guess what? If you're stuck at work, I trust my coworker to return my ballot for me. Right? If I'm stuck at home, I trust my neighbor to return my ballot for me. Or maybe I trust my pastor or I, I trust my, um, my, my kid's teacher, right? There's people we trust outside of our, our family circle to help us uh, vote. And California allows that to happen. So what we've seen out of that law, and this is an encouraging thing, this is a way to get more people to vote, is organizations have sort of ballot, ballot return parties, right? Where uh, community organizations, churches uh, will come together and say, hey, bring your ballots here and we'll go and bring them back uh, to the county for you. That's perfectly legal and encouraged because that's how we get more people to trust the system and turn their ballots in. But what we saw is these drop boxes were left unattended they were out in public spaces. They were misleadingly labeled as official. And that's illegal. Only county elections offices can establish um, drop boxes. 
And two, it was misleading, labeling them as official. So what uh, we've heard this week is uh, back from the Republican Party. There's an ongoing investigation, but this is what I can talk about, what's public, is they've agreed to not use those drop boxes. What they have agreed to is the following the law, which is they'll collect, a, someone will collect the ballot from that person. That person will sign the, the ballot envelope as the law requires, and they'll put that ballot back into the drop box and use that drop box as a receptacle to return it. They're not going to have a standalone drop box that's labeled official, that's unstaffed. Um, so they've agreed to follow the law, and but we are continuing the investigation because we still are getting reports of um, unofficial drop boxes throughout the state. So we're trying to understand the scope um, of the problem, and that's where the investigation stands uh, as of yesterday. So um, those are the details on that. I'm sure I'll get some in Q and A, but I wanted to make sure I address that as well. You know, the other issue I'll, I'll end on here is um, beyond COVID, beyond misinformation, uh, election officials are dealing with the public safety power shutoffs. We're dealing with the effects of climate change. Um, we've been preparing for that this year. Uh, counties have uh, been able to receive funding uh, to make sure they have the equipment in place to um, respond to power shutoffs or, uh, you know, or emergencies where they need to evacuate their central county offices. And we've been working with you, the utilities in both Northern California and Southern California to come up with plans. Um, they've provided us with um, analyses of where polling places and drop boxes and county election offices may be in vulnerable areas for PSPS. So that's helped us with planning purposes and making sure that the right county elections offices have backup generators um, or a plan to evacuate in case uh, of an emergency. So uh, we feel prepared for PSPS, uh, which unfortunately does peak in traditionally in late October, early November. Uh, but I want to make sure I address that because we are in, in the elections world are dealing with more than just COVID and misinformation. We're also dealing with, unfortunately, the effects of climate change. Um, but I'll leave you with some good news. Um, Californians are voting early in record numbers, as I mentioned. Californians are using our new tool, Ballot Tracks, which allows you to sort of track your ballot like a FedEx package. Over 2 million Californians have signed up for that. If you haven't yet, I please encourage you to do so. Um, and we are reaching historical numbers of uh, voter registration. We'll, we probably hit 22 million registered voters by the time we hit election day, which is a historical high, not only in a rate, but number. So uh, voters are paying attention, they're engaging, uh, and uh, it's gonna be a, um, I think an overwhelming turnout, um, even compared to the last highest turnout, which was 2008 presidential election. So again, thank you for having me. I know that was a lot, but I'm uh, here to answer questions as well. Thank you so much, James. Um, before we go to questions from the audience, do any of the panel members have questions for each other from the presentations? So, We've gotten quite a few questions. Uh, some of them actually have already been responded to, um, but let me start with John. Um, do you have health concerns about many of these vote in person centers? Are these gonna become super spreader sites? Or do you think that these large voting, but not by mail, but voting in person um, sites are actually dangerous from the point of view of, of COVID-19? Yeah, super spreading seems to be an event that occurs when someone's infected at the peak of their contagion, which is typically about 12, 24 hours be before they become symptomatic, who's in a, um, usually in an enclosed building um, and not wearing a mask. So I think that um, as long as people are wearing a mask and social distancing, even though the voting is going to be inside, um, it should not be a risk of super spreading events. And frankly, um, if I'm wearing a mask, I'm social distancing, I, I have, I'll bring some um, alcohol with me um, for disinfecting my hands and I will be meticulously careful. And if everybody else has a mask on in that room, I'm not gonna worry one bit. Great, thank you. Um, for Batral, um, how would this election potentially end up in the U.S. Supreme Court? 
And then somebody also asked a separate question, can a court with the new um, currently nominee be trusted to do what's right? I'm not gonna ask you that question, but um, how would this wind up in the Supreme Court? So there are at least two pathways by which you can see um, this election going to the Supreme Court. There are more, and there's multiple you know, variations and hypotheticals you can run to. But I see two main pathways by which uh, the case, uh, this election could go to the Supreme Court. One will be something that looks like the look like the 2000 election, in which there is a dispute about the administration of the election and the counting of ballots. And um, I think that a potential flashpoint for such a dispute might be Pennsylvania. And a particular aspect of Pennsylvania law provides for the potential for contestation. That's the aspect of, of Pennsylvania law that provides for um, persons can vote and, and, and as so long as their ballot is postmarked by election day, their ballot will be counted. And the postmarking system, unfortunately, is not regularized to such an extent that all ballots that are necessarily cast on election day will be postmarked by the post office. And we saw this with respect to the Wisconsin primaries, and we might see this with respect to the Pennsylvania um, general election. And what that could mean is that there will be a contest over whether these non-postmarked ballots should count. Um, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has ruled that if they are, if they have been more likely than not have to have been cast on election on election day or prior, they will be counted. But I imagine that there will be contestation around that. There will also be contests around signature verification, probably, with and also the process for curing errors in election on election ballots um, that different states provide. And so these election administration um, points can be points of contestation that could reach the Supreme Court. As for the Second, perhaps um, more troubling one is if we have a situation which seemed more likely um, a couple of weeks ago, less likely now, but could become likely again in a couple of weeks, is if we have a situation where President Trump, for example, wins or is in the lead, excuse me, on election day in enough states to count up to 270, he proclaims himself the victor. Um, other sort of media outlets perhaps follow that declaration and validate that declaration. And then later you find as a result of the full counting of mail-in ballots that there has been a shift and that Biden has won enough states to win an electoral college count. And what you have is a situation in which Republican legislators in those states that see the shift decide even though the total counting of ballots leads to a Biden victory, that they are going to slate the electors for the electoral college for President Trump and a Democratic governor in a state like Pennsylvania or, or whatnot decides on the basis of the full counting of the ballots that they're going to slate their electorals for president or for candidate Joe Biden. And so then you have a contested elector situation in which there's no clear process for resolving in the Constitution that could perhaps um, be addressed by the court. So um, it's not clear if the court would want to take this on. They might leave it to the legislative branches um, to deal with it, but that could lead to par paralysis with the Republican-controlled Senate and a Democratic-controlled House if that continues to be the case after the election. And so there's no clear resolution, but that's about another possible point of intervention by the Supreme Court. Thank you. Um, Amy, um, one question is, you talked a great deal about the importance of women of color voting and the organization of women in color. Clearly one of the aspects of the Trump campaign and it was manifest in the debate was to try to separate Biden from this base of support. Do you think there's gonna be any success in that or do you think that women and particularly women of color are going to be um, high turnout voters? Uh, I appreciate the question. First is women and then there's women of color. The, the term, the political use of the term women has always defaulted to be white women, but, they, but we need to acknowledge the majority of white women have been Republican, supported Trump, and are likely to do so uh, this year. Uh, of course, support amongst white women has, has softened this year amongst particular subcategories of white women, uh, but that is not the case with women of color, and that's across the spectrum uh, black women were over more than more than 97 percent of black women voted against Trump last time and uh, that the percentages will be high across women of color. Um, so I think uh, 
part, part of uh, what we're what we need to do is to understand that is a strategy to um, uh, at least in, in 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 part we've we've heard of attacks directly on a whole slew of uh, black and brown women in uh, political office. Uh, uh, in uh, you know, and and in others, sports figures and uh, people in the media, um, the the fancy word for that is massage noir, which is the particular attacks, uh, racist and sexist attacks against Black women. Um, this will continue uh, to be. This has continued to be the case the last four years, um, but it's something that uh, women of color. Uh, saw, we saw through and uh, have been fighting against consistently for the last four years. And um, so the, the other thing is, remember, we had an historically diverse set of candidates in the presidential primary for the Democratic Party. Um, it, was, it was Black women over 60 who delivered uh, the ultimate victory uh, to Biden, those who lived in South Carolina. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, but ultimately it was, uh, you know, both Biden and a combination of Kamala Harris that uh, uh, a lot of women of color are very enthused about. So the attempt to kind of divide and conquer, which has been, um, you know, has, has worked for, for Trump for very effectively in terms of activating people who can hear and respond to racist messages and convert that into votes, that, that has been uh, consistent. The, the thing is, focusing on women of color, there isn't, um, there has not been a serious play in terms of policy or embracing women of color in terms of any political uh, uh, calculus. And so the, the, the likelihood of uh, a percentage, a higher percentage going to Trump is, is near nil. I will say though, the percentages are high, but ultimately in, in states that we were talking about, like in Pennsylvania, um, uh, in other states, those key battleground states that'll determine the electoral votes, it really is the, the turnout numbers, um, which is why women of color need to increase turnout in, other, in, in order to be decisive in, in, um, in the presidential contest. But no, we're not, we're not seeing, if anything, we're seeing um, uh, a Biden-Harris ticket, uh, particularly Kamala Harris playing this very unique role of bringing people together across race and gender and really articulating, hey, we're Americans and, and upholding all of that. That's, that's in influencing and incentivizing people who are otherwise might stay home. Thank you. Uh, James, what are our expectations about counting? And isn't the process of processing mail-in ballots where every signature has to get checked just a unbelievably cumbersome and slow process or has technology intervened and now we actually might get results at some point relatively soon after the election? So um, California for, for a, many election cycles has allowed uh, four weeks for county election officials to complete the, the ballot count. Um, this year, because of the increase in vote by mail, we actually allowed counties to start processing vote by mail ballots 28 days before the election. Before it was 10 days. So counties now have uh, a lot more runway to prepare ballots, get them ready to hit count on election day. Um, it is because this is all new, we don't know if that, how much that would impact the, the count on the back end. But I like to remind people that in California, we like to get the results right and not fast. Uh, and we are prepared to fight for against the misinformation that we expect. Uh, as as Betrol mentioned, it's 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 common, right? In terms of, um, you know, we saw that in 2018 with House seats in Orange County, where uh, as the vote by mail ballots are coming in. Uh, the, you know, someone who was in the lead was now in second place and people screamed voter fraud. So we're prepared to fight against that. But uh, I like to remind people that we want to get it right and not fast, because not only do we allow for those ballots postmarked by election day to come in within uh, 17 days, we allow voters to fix issues with their vote by mail ballot. And especially this year with so many new people voting by mail, they might forget to sign their envelope. They might forget uh, how they register to vote with which signature and their signature gets flagged as mismatched. California uh, allows voters to fix that. And so there's gonna be time even after election day where that's possible and counties will be contacting voters to come and fix it. After we process the ballots, 
um, we then audit them. Uh, you know, ballots are counted by machines, but to make sure those machines are, are accurate and, and, uh, and working, we do a, um, an audit of them to make sure the hand count matches the machine count. So we want to get it right, not fast, and we want to get it accurate. So that's what I like to remind people is, you know, California, um, this is nothing new in California. In other states where they try to rush the count, that's where you're going to see the mistakes. One of the battles you've seen in some of these states that are ramping up vote by mail is whether or not they can even, how many days they even have to count the vote by mail ballots. And that's where it's going to be a concern. Uh, in states where they don't have more than a couple of days to count vote by mail ballots, that's where you're going to see the problems rather than here in California where we have ample time. I think uh, in terms of the bigger picture in the presidential race, I don't think California is going to be much of a surprise for anyone. <laughs> it never really is. Uh, but it probably will come down to those house races again uh, in certain parts of California that will um, be sort of the, you know, the, the source of some misinformation around, you know, late vote by mail ballots. Thank you. Um, we have already reached our appointed time. I want to thank all of the panelists. I want to thank the audience. Um, and if you have additional questions, we will still be receiving questions and to some extent we'll try to respond if that's at all possible. So thank you again for attending. Thank you panelists and I wish you all a very good election. Thank you. <laughs>